We are live and welcome to Waters Garden Center. My name is Michelle and I will be teaching the fruit tree class today. So bear with me. My allergies just kicked into high gear this morning, of course. So I'm sneezing and runny and all that stuff, but um, it is just allergies. So bear with me. Um, I have spring fever and hay fever and I work at a garden center. So it's... It, I love my job, um, but um, today's class is all about fruit trees and um, growing them in Prescott or the Tri-City area, Quad City area. I don't know, have we made more? <laughs> um, but welcome, I appreciate you guys all coming down here in person. And we're just gonna touch on fruit trees today, uh, a few small fruits, but fruit trees do very, very well here in this area. Um, the ones that we get in have the required chill hours, which keeps them producing properly. Um, and we'll go into chill hours in just a moment. So when you guys think of fruit trees, um, what are you thinking about? Are you looking at a full grown orchard? You just want a few of your favorite fruits to grow in your yard, um, just so you can go out and pick your favorite peach or uh, cherry, apple, pear, that type of thing. Most of us are in that category. We're not into big orchards. A lot of us don't have that property size that makes that adequate to do. Um, but um, fruit trees do very, very well. And they make sm great small ornamental trees as well um, because most of them are semi-dwarf. Um, so semi-dwarf actually means that they will get 15 feet if you just let them go. Um, the really nice thing about fruit trees is they don't mind being topped. Um, so they are very easily pruned to the size that you want. Um, if you only want your tree to be 10 foot, keep it at 10 foot. Um, very easy to do. Um, it's a lot easier to pick your fruit when it's 10 feet instead of climbing up a tall ladder and falling off. And eh. um, But um, we don't want anybody to do that. Um, so um, fruit trees are very versatile. Um, so what I always tell people is figure out what you want to plant. Um, do you like apples, peaches, pomegranates, pears, plums? All of that stuff will grow up here. Um, we have uh, a, most of the varieties that we have right now is what we're trying to keep in this year. Um, so I have three or four or five different peaches, um, a couple of different apricots. We will get more um, Apples are just now starting to come in. So basically whatever type of apple or peach pear that you like, we usually get in. Um, so kind of make a list of what you're looking for. The earlier you can get them into the ground and now is why we really push it because they're dormant right now. Um, they are going to stay dormant until once you get them planted, then they can wake up here and be acclimated. You don't get transplant shock if you get them in while they're dormant. Um, if you get them in now also, basically you're just, they're gonna just sit in the ground because the ground is too cold for any root movement or any of that. Um, so we're just kind of watering them occasionally every two weeks um, is what we water in the winter time here. Um, unless we get some significant rain or snow, which we really haven't. Um, we've had a couple, but not 
significant. Um, so you should be watering all your trees and shrubs right now every two weeks. Uh, once March gets here and we start warming up, then we kind of roll into that once a week thing, um, especially once they start leafing out. Um, they'll need more water at that point. Um, but fruit trees make great ornamental trees. Like I said, a lot of them have beautiful fall color, um, which also adds to that aesthetics in the fall. Um, so always think about fruit trees in that way. Um, chill hours. So chill hours are what we do um, for or what we need for them to fruit. Um, and chill hours are any temperatures below 45. So that's how many hours below 45 that they need. And that's usually during the nighttime time that we get that. Um, so it's through the winter months. Um, which, so if your peach tree says 800 chill hours, that means it needs 800 cold days under 45 in order to uh, bear, or it'll start flowering at that point. Um, so that's what we're looking for. The, the bigger the number, the later it blooms. Um, so you want those big numbers. Um, some of those apples like Pink Lady, um, which is a very popular apple, only has two or 200 chill hours. So it, it'll do well here, but sometimes it, it doesn't, it fruits out early, really early. So you don't necessarily always get fruit for it. Um, now is the time to buy. Um, we just got these fruit trees in on Monday, and I swear in the last two days we've sold about half of them. So they are going fast. Um, and I don't know what this year is going to bring. Um, it's become a very strange year for us with the transportation issue and everything else. Um, it's kind of, I'm hoping that we get back on a regular roll. Um, we've got two trucks next week which will have some fruit trees on it as well. So hopefully we can restock and keep going. Um, but what I've been telling people is if you see something that you like, buy it now, because um, it might not be here next week when you come in. Um, let's see. Let's kind of go through the fruit trees and then we'll get back into the information. Um, and um, I have some charts that we'll pass out um, we do, we will send you links. Uh, Ken has a fruit tree book that uh, is online that you can download. Um, he'll send you, Ken will send you um, all that information. So all I need is your name and your email address. Please make it legible or you won't receive it. Um, but um, it's just for this class. So if you signed up last week for um, the soil prep, you won't get the fruit tree stuff. Um, so this is specific for this class. Let me start with this side and we'll start with this side. Okay. Sure. Well, we'll get into some of those issues in, in, in uh, at towards the end uh, because apple trees are a little bit different. You need pollinators um, and stuff like that. So, um, and and it sounds like you've got coddling moth, which everybody that has an apple tree has that problem. So we will get into that. <laughs> okay, so you ready to pan? We're gonna pan. <laughs> Um, so some of the fruit trees that we can actually grow here, um, we'll start with the persimmon. Um, the Fuyu persimmon, it grows very, very well here. Um, this is one of those that has a 200 chill hour um, for blossoming, which means it will bloom. Um, you may get fruit every other year. Basically, when... Um, Peaches are usually one of the first things to bloom, um, but this one will bloom pretty close to that. 
Um, so uh, if you like persimmons, they do very, very well here. And um, now's a great time. I do not get very many of these trees in just because they're kind of very selective for people. Um, so we don't bring a ton of them in, but just a few. Um, they're also hard to grind. Um, pear trees. All pear trees do really well here as uh, two. Um, there are the American pears and the Europe, um, or the European pears and the, the uh, Japanese pears. Um, so um, the Japanese pears pollinate each other and the European pears will pollinate. Um, there are a few pears that actually are self-fertile. Um, the Bartlett is one of them. So basically pollination means you might need another tree. So keep that in mind, especially with your pears and your apple trees. Um, but this is a kind of a neat one because it's a red Bartlett. Um, so it, the skin on the pears actually have that beautiful red color. Um, very, very pretty and striking. And they're, they're very, very tasty. Um, apples, apples do very, very well. Um, the nice thing about apples um, is that um, they, they bloom, strangely enough, late after the peaches do. Um, so usually you will get apples before you get peaches on that regular basis. It just depends on when we get our frosts. Um, our frosts are the most detriment to our, our fruit trees. Um, and, and the tree itself will do fine. You just might not get production that year because um, it depends on the cycle when they actually freeze, whether you'll get fruit or not. Um, most of your apples do need a pollinator. There is about three or four types that actually are self-pollinating or semi-self-fertile, um, which means that you'll get a crop, but you won't get that productive thousands of apples that normally will come, but sometimes that's okay, I think, unless you're really into apples. Um, this tree here is a, a, three, a four in one pear, um, which is kind of cool. Um, I did have a four in one cherries, pears, apples, and a fruit salad. I do have two of the fruit salads left, which is kind of neat. Um, but uh, basically there's four trees grafted onto this guy. Um, so um, on this one, uh, we have a Danju, a Bartlett, a Bosque, and Mr. Lane cut the one off of this one. When Ken helps undo trees, he gets a little nuts and he starts pulling tags off. It's like, don't do that. Um, so I can find out what the other one is. Um, my guess is it is in a, uh, one of the Asian pears uh, because this one, um, it, it, the Danju would need a pollinator and that would be its pollinator. Yes, ma'am. So usually you will get her question was about pollination and how close the trees actually need to be in order to pollinate. Usually if you're in that 25 to 50 foot range, you're good to go. Um, so as far as spacing your trees, if you want your tree to be full grown and be 15 feet as the semi dwarf will get, you will want your trees about every 15 feet. So you're looking at your center point and then 15 feet from that. That means you have your uh, eight feet on one side and seven foot on the other, or seven and a half, if you wanted to be really technical about it. Um, and that will give you your proper spacing. Now, if you plan on keeping your trees smaller, say in that 10 foot range, you could go every 10 feet. But air circulation is very important. So you, you don't want to cram them together. If you have the space, let them breathe if you can, unless you want to really keep them small. Her question is, is, does it matter which trees pollinate? Yes, you do need specific trees to pollinate. Um, obviously, apples will pollinate apples. Um, some of your crab apples can pollinate apple trees as well. Um, certain pears will pollinate certain pears and your cherries 
you need two separate ones. Um, usually it's a different variety. So like with your cherry trees, um, a Bing cherry, you cannot pollinate a Bing cherry with another ch Bing cherry. You need a black deuterium or a Rainier. Those two pollinate each other very well. Um, so pollination, um, we did not get them out this week and it was on our to-do list, so I apologize in advance, but I'll try to find them if I can. Um, on our website as well, there are pollination charts. Uh, maybe we can add that too. Okay, great. Great. So um, just check it. And it basically, all you do is you look up, say, honey crisp apple, and you can, it'll, it'll say yes or no what trees will pollinate each one. Um, the only apples that I know that are actually self fertile are like the Gala, uh, Granny Smith, uh, both are, are self fertile. So um, good question though. Um, nectarine trees. Um, we have two different varieties, three different varieties of nectarines. Um, this one here is a flavor top. We also have fan Fantasia and we have the Heavenly White. So if you like that white fruit, we do have a white nectarine. Uh, nectarines do very well. Um, beautiful blossoms. I mean, if you were looking for an ornamental tree, this is spectacular. It has very large double blooms and they're bright pink um, and then orange gold fall color. You got way pushed way back there. Come on. Okay. Uh, apricots do very well here as well. Um, nice big fruit. Um, usually a blush on the skin like we're used to and they taste so much better than they do in the store. We're going to pan over here. I'm doing my best, Vanna. Um, peaches, um, like I said, I have like six different peaches. I have a Ranger, Reliance, Alberta, uh, Hail Haven, Red Haven, and then the Snow Beauty White Peach. Um, they all do very, very well. Um, all are clean stone. I do have dwarf peaches as well. Um, and these are true dwarfs, um, which means that they'll only get about six feet. They are very prolific in terms of the size of your actual tree. Um, I got, I have one of these, he's been in the ground for four years. I got about 35 peaches last year. Um, they were on the smaller side because I was really bad and got really busy here and didn't thin it out. Um, but they were very, very tasty, even though they were small. Um, plum trees do very, very well, uh, too. Um, some of your plums do need a pollinator. Uh, Santa Rosa is self-fertile, which means it's a really good pollinator as well. Um, great eating plum. Um, the Italian prune, which is the small purple plum, is also self-fertile. Green gauge um, is a self-fertile one. Um, most of your big black and red plums do need a pollinator, and Santa Rosa is a great pollinator, so uh, this will be on your choice. Um, this guy here is our fruit salad. Um, the cool thing about this is that it's three different trees, uh, three different fruits on one tree. So we have a plum tree, a nectarine tree, and a peach tree all on one tree which is kind of cool. If you have a small yard, you can get it all done in one. Um, so uh, great little tree. Like I said, I only have two of these left. And last but not least is the cherry trees. Do I need to move this over? Okay. Um, Stella cherry is one of the self-fertile cherries. Um, it will pollinate any of the other cherries. Um, but if you just need one tree, 
this is the one. Uh, it's a nice, sweet, dark cherry. Um, Lapin is another self-fertile cherry. I don't have any of those yet, but I do have the Stellas. Um, we do have some Bing cherries now. And then the Mount Morency cherry is your pie cherry. Um, it's the sour cherry. And Mount Morency is also self-fertile, so you only need one for that one. Um, and it also makes a good pollinator for the other cherry trees. Okay, um, some of the other uh, fruits that we do um, that are more bush form, we do do pomegranates here. Um, most of them will get in that six to seven feet. We keep them kind of small. Um, the bigger ones tend to freeze out a little bit, but the angel red uh, is a really nice uh, pomegranate and I actually have some coming in dormant in a couple of weeks so I'll have those ready for us. Uh, the really cool thing about those is they're so pretty. They have these bright orange blossoms in the spring and they're just spectacular and then you have the bright red pomegranates at, in the fall so uh, great ornamental tree. Um, kind of get in that six by six so if you have a smaller yard and just want one fruit they, they do make a great fruit tree. Um, Smaller fruits, um, I did bring some up. I know it's fruit tree class, um, but we do have a wide variety of other fruits uh, available. Um, grapes, raspberries, blueberries, um, and, and there'll be several different varieties of all of those. So depending on whatever size of yard you can do, if you want fruits, you can do that. Good, thank you for bringing those up. Uh, she asked how figs do, we do get figs. Um, usually they come in towards the end of April. Um, they do tend to freeze somewhat, um, so you don't get these huge trees like you do in other places um, because they do tend to die back some, but they do well, um, yes. So her question was, is do you plant the smaller fruits while they're dormant or can you do it later? Um, basically you can do it at any time. I just like to get them in at, when they're dormant because they don't go through that transplant shock that they can during the other seasons. Um, so yeah, do what, those we tend to keep in stock, um, but the fruit trees, I'm kind of concerned about them this year. So uh, just for that reason. Uh, her question was that she she had a, a apple tree die because she planted it too deep. I've never had a, a heard of it poisoning any soils um, unless there was a, 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 a disease in it. Um, but if it was seven years ago, you should be able to plant another tree in it. Um, only time I would be concerned about that is if there was some sort of virus fire blight or something like that in the soil, because that is a very bad bacteria virus that, that they get. Um, so, um, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Dwarf trees in pots, yes, you could definitely do them in pots. You can even do the semi-dwarf in pots. Um, just kind of keep them smaller because the canopy can get so big that they can, um, you can um, just make sure you have a big enough pot to start with um, and, and you should be just fine. Um, Ken and Lisa ha have a, I think it's a cherry tree at their place. Um, that they have in a pot and, and they've had it in the pot for years. So it is produces every year and everything else. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a nectarine. Uh, the fruit salad has a nectarine plum and a, a peach. Yeah. Yeah. They're all self pollinators. Okay. So um, maintenance. 
maintenance on your fruit trees is very, very important because we got a lot of things going right now. Well, not right now. Um, so um, with your dormant trees, if you have them already established, last year's fungal issues and bug, thrip, aphids can lay eggs on those branches and trees. So this time of year, um, usually wait closer to when they're budding out. The buds are really tight right now. Um, and by the time we don't want to put it on too early because what the dormant oil will do on those trees is smother anything that's laying dormant on those trees. So it'll, it, it kind of eradicates some of that existing problems that might be on your trees. Um, that is not to say once you spray the dormant oil, you are especially free from all other issues because aphids and fungal issues blow in and come in with the birds and all sorts of stuff. So we're just kind of being preventative in the dormant oil. Um, it, it's a good practice to keep um, when you are doing fruit trees. Um, the other thing in that thought is do clean up in your yard. If you get rid of all those yard wastes, if you had a bad apple crop last year, make sure you got all of those leaves, all the bad apples out of there, because if you leave them rotting, all of those larvae eggs are still sitting there and you're just reintroducing them as, as the season goes on. Um, I've been doing some research on the coddling moth and those little boogers are prolific. Um, and they're, they're something that you are working on all the time to eradicate, especially if you have a tree that is fully engrossed, you don't get a good apple at all. Um, so there are several things you can do to keep those away. Um, and, and basically the coddling moths will take care of the apples and the, the pears they tend to get into. Um, so what coddling moths damage does is when you pick your apple, you have the brown spot in there and, and basically it's where they've laid the egg in the flower bed or the flower pod. And basically it's the larvae actually coming out of the apple, not something going into the apple. Um, so that is where that is, uh, what happens in that. Um, there are different generations of uh, the coddling moths. So they start out at the moth, they lay their eggs. Most of those eggs are laid in the soil and then in the flower buds. So they can either climb up the tree as a caterpillar or they, they are in the buds when when they lay so you're, you're combating on two different zones um, and i was never aware that they did the soil i thought it was all in the the flower buds um so say that again is the coddling moth poisonous no um so what we use on a coddling moth um i do recommend the pheromone tents um it's a trap um Hopefully we get them in. She's been trying for weeks to get them in and we've had no luck. Um, but basically what it is is a tent that has the coddling moth pheromone. So it attracts the moths. So when those moths are, are flying around is when they're starting to lay the eggs. Um, so once you start seeing them in that trap, you know you can start spraying. You can, um, I've read that you could put cardboard bands around your smoother apple trees and that when they start crawling up they'll climb into that and then you just pull it off replace it and for the next generation um, but um, it, it's something to pay attention to and once you start spraying you're going to do it about every seven days um, so be cognitive of it. Um, if you can catch them in that larva stage, the BT works as well. Um, so you, there are two uh, defenses for them. And um, from what I've been researching, it helps if you kind of go back and forth on your, your 
insecticides and, and your bug killers because they get resistant to one or the other. So if you switch off, they, they kind of lose that resistance because you're kind of confusing the cycle. Um, did someone say something? So the, the dormant oil, we spray in the flowers and then after, once the flowers start blooming, you spray it in the evening when the bees aren't around and it basically suffocates any larvae that are laying in those eggs or in the flowers, I'm sorry. Um, and you do that, like I said, every seven to 10 days because not all of the blossoms pop out at the same time. And then you spray it another week after they're done blooming. Uh, usually if you do that on a regular basis every year, you're gonna cut most of those down. You're not gonna get them all out, but. Apples and pears. Yeah. The dormant oil, horticulture oil is the same thing. Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, well, you'll do the dormant oil on it um, once it gets established in your yard because it'll take care of all the aphid bugs or eggs and, and thrip eggs and, and um, peaches tend to get shot hole. That'll take care of that uh, somewhat. But like I said, a lot of these things kind of blow in and out with the wind. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is just so everybody knows um, when to do what, we've come up with this kind of cool chart. Um, so um, I'm going to pass them out. We'll start over here. I've got 50 of them, so hopefully I can get through. Uh, if not, we will, uh, because you're on the list, we will send these out as well, um, so you'll have it. Um, but we sat down and came up with this chart um, that we can go through. Um, it kind of just goes step by step what you're going to be doing in your yard uh, for your fruit trees. So starting in January or February, um, we're, we're going to sp uh, spray the dormant oil, um, which is this. Um, we've got it in two different uh, bottles right now. Um, this is a ready to use, so you just hook it up to the hose and start spraying your tree. Um, the other is a concentrate that we, uh, you can mix, uh, mix up in a, like the Hudson sprayer, uh, hose end sprayer, and, and you spray your tree down. Um, if your tree is small enough, you can just do a handheld sprayer and you, you're good to go. Um, but basically what horticultural oil is, it, it's a mineral oil derivative. Um, so we're just suffocating everything that's sitting on that tree. Um, and we're going to do that, like I said, about now. Um, February and March is time for pruning. Um, when it comes to pruning your fruit trees, when they're newly planted, you really don't want to do a lot of pruning on your trees. You want to give them two or three years to get good root system in the ground before you start pruning. Because as soon as you start pruning, the tree says, ooh, I can take off right now. Um, and then that takes the energy out of your roots. Um, so you kind of want to make sure that, that all your energy goes to the root system because without a healthy root system, your fruit's not going to be prolific. It's not going to taste good. Um, it's not going to support your tree. So you want healthy roots so you can have this nice, big, beautiful, prolific tree. Um, March and April, we're going to fertilize. Um, so a couple of years ago, we uh, got into the fruit and vegetable, or we reintroduced it. Um, so this is a, um, basically, it's a blood, bone meal, calcium derivative um, that Ken came up with. Um, I use this on my vegetable gardens and on my fruit trees. Um, because of the calcium content in it, it gives you nice big fruits. Um, and that helps with the flavor and all of that. Um, so that's what we do in April, uh, March and April. Um, June, June is when we're gonna start thinning our fruit. So we all want this big tree with all of these fruits. 
Well, if you let that tree go with all of those fruits, you're going to end up with very small fruits. Um, some of them will actually drop themselves. They try to do that. It's just kind of self-preservation because that's a lot of energy and they just can't. It's, it's like when you go out for a run and you've just overdone it, your heart's beating so fast that it can't control. So you, you want to thin those fruits out. So most things um, for most of your your fruit trees, you want it four to six inches apart, one fruit per. Um, I, I'll get to cherries in just a second. Um, so this is for your bigger, larger fruits. Um, cherries do not need to be thinned. Um, they're, they're one that seem to be fine. But every six inches, you're going to thin down your tree. When they're freshly planted, take it down to as much as you can possibly bear. So keep a few fruits. Again, fruit production takes that energy from your root system. Um, you don't want a lot of fruit until the tree is about three years old. Then you can just let it do its thing. But you still want to thin it out because, again, the more fruits, the smaller they'll be. Um, and you won't get those big peaches that you're looking for. Um, let's see. Uh, July, we're going to fertilize again. So it sounds like for all of those that are new here, it sounds like we fertilize a lot, and we do. Um, the soil in Prescott in the Quad City areas is a dead soil. We have a high desert. Our pH is off, out of, off the charts. Um, so we need to change that. Um, if you are using this fruit tree um, fertilizer, it does not have the sulfur in it like the 744, which is, but it wouldn't be organic if we did. Um, so I would add sulfur in a little bit in the spring and a little bit in the fall just to help lower that pH level. Um, you can also start harvesting your cherry trees. Um, most of your cherries do start um, ripening sometime in July. Of course, we are very have strange weather patterns here, so it just kind of depends on the year when you're actually going to go. But most of them will start fruiting or being ripe at the end of July. Um, some of your peaches as well, plums um, and apricots. August... Um, most of your cherries should be almost done, and that's when I start seeing my peach, uh, it, as far as my pixie, uh, my peach tree kind of finishes up uh, mid-August, um, and they're ready to pick. Um, when I get to the end of this, I kind of have a, a, a thing that says when things are ripe, so I'll go through that too. Um, most of your... Um, Apples and pears are September and October, and then we're going to fertilize in October as well. Um, so that's kind of a timetable of how to do things. Obviously, it's not scientific, um, but like I said, each season's going to be just a little bit different. If you miss a month, you can still fertilize or uh, prune as you need to. Um, really quick on pruning, um, like I said, you don't want to prune a lot the first couple of years. And basically, a lot of fruit trees um, do pretty well on their own. But what you're looking for is anything that's going to be crossing. So, for instance, say this tree is three years old and um, we're, we're looking at pruning. Anything that's kind of going on the inside is what we're going to try to take out because as your tree grows, all the leaves and things um, keep that sun from hitting the fruits and stuff. And that's when you start getting um, fruits that aren't ripening um, as like others, uh, smaller fruits and stuff like that. So you want to get that nice airflow. So you want to kind of uh, keep all of the inside um, a little bit clear and you don't want any branches to be touching. So eventually this branch here is going to need to be cut because it's going to touch this guy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. uh, so we, uh, her question is, it, can you over prune a tree if it's very large? Um, and when do you do that? So we do prune in the spring. Um, and uh, you can over prune a tree. So I never want to take more than a third off of anything that you prune. Um, doing so uh, kind of sends things into shock. Um, so just start uh, from the top and just do it year by year and eventually you'll get it down um, and you won't shock your tree completely. Anything that's, huh? No, no. Take out what you need as far as your size goes, um, but um, you really want to focus on those ones on the inside to break up and get more light into the middle uh, of the tree. You can prune. Uh, he asked if it's too early. You can prune now. Um, my, the only concern about doing it later is we should be out of those deep freeze times so I, I i think you're okay um the only thing that you might get is if we do get really cold like we were a couple three four weeks ago you might get a little bit more die back off of it that's the only thing that would happen no it won't kill the tree yeah yes sir correct uh, so his question is that uh, when you're, you're some, sometimes when you get a tree in a pot, uh, some of the roots kind of, they have nowhere else to go, so they do start to spiral a little bit. Um, so yeah, when you go to plant a tree, um, when you take it out of the pot that it's in, definitely score it um, several times. I always do an X on the bottom and then usually four or five scores on the other side. Just doing that gets them to go out instead of continuing to go around. Um, and that'll break that up, yeah. Um, when you dig your holes, you wanna go twice as wide as the pot that it's in and just as deep. We don't want it any deeper. Um, so we, the reason we don't do deeper is because of our monsoon season. Um, you always want your tree to be even with the soil. If you're gonna err, you would rather be actually up an inch uh, above the soil. So your root ball, it, it's okay if your root ball is up, against, uh, up above the soil. You just put a layer of soil on top of it and it's okay. It gives you better drainage. And we have really bad drainage here, most of us do, um, because of our heavy clay soils. So if you need better drainage, it's okay to bring it up a little bit and then just mound it up a little above it. Um, yeah. Just an inch. So yeah, with, with caliche soils, we want to go, um, especially if you have very bad drainage soil. Um, if you're concerned about the hole, fill it up with water first before you plant and just see how long it should, it takes to drain. If it does not drain within four to eight hours, probably not a good place to plant a tree. Okay. Yes, sir. Say that again. pH. Yes. So most of your pH trees, um, like in that seven, um, uh, seven point seven, I'm not a scientist. So in that seven area, um, most of us have eights and nines sometimes. So that's what the sulfur is for. That sulfur brings that pH level down into a more neutral uh, area. And that's what we want for fruit trees. Okay. Some of the questions that I get is, um, why are my fruits small? Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but you do need to thin your trees. Um, that will definitely help. Consistent watering is also necessary. Um, I kind of skipped. Let me back up just a second. Um, back to planting. Um, 
I got off track, I apologize. Um, so we've got the hole. You're gonna mix two thirds natural soil into one third mulch. Unfortunately, right now I'm out of mulch. Um, so we are using the barn barn barnyard manure um, at least this weekend until the mulch actually comes in. Barnyard manure, uh, everybody's kind of worried about it being hot right now because the trees are going in dormant. There's no movement in the ground because the soil is too cold. It's okay, you're fine. If this was in the middle of June, I would say stay away from the barnyard manure, but right now it is fine to plant it in. So if you buy a fruit tree today, get the barn barn manure. It acts as that organic material when you're planting. It helps break up that clay that you have, um, and then we're ready to go there. Um, you can mix your fertilizer in, let it kind of work down. So when the roots and stuff start waking up in March, it's already ready and available for it. Okay. Um, nets. Netting. Um, birds love our fruits just as much as you do. So once you start seeing your fruits start forming, it's a good time to get the netting on, especially those like cherries. Birds love cherries. So make sure you net the entire tree. Now, I know that sounds daunting, but you do want to make sure that it's clipped around the base of the tree. Um, because if you leave it open, they're really smart birds and they'll just go right up inside that hole. Um, so make sure you put your netting on or you're just, unless you just want to feed the birds and then leave it big. Um, but this works really well on your uh, peaches, apples, all of that stuff. Uh, another reason to kind of keep them small and then you don't have to worry about a 15 foot tr tree. Okay, so when is my fruit ripe? Um, so uh, I found these facts the last time I did this class, so I'll just kind of touch base with you. Um, pears, um, usually in September, mid-September, um, towards October. Um, we always, you can check. I mean, if you have a lot of fruits, you can check to see if they're ripe. Um, but your, your seeds will be slightly light brown um, inside. Um, they will be hard, um, which is normal for them. Um, apples, your seeds are going to be even darker, uh, dark brown. Um, and then your uh, skin will go from a dull color to a bright uh, color. Um, so your reds are going to start shining more um, and, and they'll, you'll see that noticeable skin difference. Um, your apricots and, and peaches um, are when your, your fruit does start to soften, um, but kind of be careful with this. Uh, the year before, I kind of kept trying and trying and then it was finally soft. I put them on the counter for a day and, and they really started to take a turn. So I think I waited a little bit long. So if they're still a little bit hard, as long as you're in that mid-August to end of August time frame, you should be good to pick your, your, your peaches and apricots. Um, cherries will go dark. Um, they'll be that nice dark cherry color. Um, and the longer, but the longer that you leave them on your tree, especially if they're netted, the sweeter they'll be. Um, figs the stems will start to droop um, so you'll you'll know when they're ready to be harvest um, okay there we go all right we have done it okay so let's open this up for questions yes lucky you <laughs> So her question is, is she has this large apricot tree and should she spray the dormant oil now? I would actually wait until first of March and then start because our buds are starting. I mean, these, some of the fruit trees that just came in, I mean, they're ready to pop. Um, but um, the ones that are more dormant, like the cherry tree over here, the ones that are in your yard, it's not ready yet. Um, so I would wait until the first of March and then go ahead and spray. If you, um, 
Johnny's Tree Service does a really good job on pruning fruit trees. Um, he used to teach the pruning class um, with us. So if you go to that YouTube video, um, they uh, he does a really good uh, explanation on how to prune. Um, but um, if you give them a call, they can do a really good job on trimming. Yes, your, your apricot will self-pollinate. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm really sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, so he has a gopher problem, um, which a lot of us do. Um, gophers is another one of those things that if you don't stay on top of, um, they have very many generations, so you have to stay on top of them. Um, we do have uh, gopher shields. Uh, if you're planting a new tree, you can. It, it's a hardware cloth that you put around the root ball, um, and it protects those tender new roots uh, from a gopher. However, it, it, once the tree gets large enough, the, and you don't take care of that gopher problem, you will have issues. Um, there are two things that I have found that work. Um, the mole max, if you are just kind of trying to prevent and create a, a defendable space from them, the mole max is a granular product that you can put down um, that kind of goes into their holes. It smells nasty um, and that works fairly well. Um, you do have to reapply it more than the bag says, um, just because of our dry, windy conditions and the sun. Um, but it, it works pretty well. Um, the other thing that works really well is the gopher probe. Um, the gopher probe, you kind of try to find the holes and it goes down and then you release the pellets and it kills them underground. And uh, it is a one kill uh, product, so you don't have to worry about animals getting it on a second, you know, picking it up and carrying it off. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, her question was what, a wind protection. Um, the only time you need to protect it from the wind is when it's newly planted. You definitely want to stake any tree that you plant uh, at least for a year or two. Um, so basically what I wait for, um, I live in Dewey and I'm up on the top of a hill, so I get wind all the time. Um, so when you are, after your tree's been in the ground for a while, um, just go and kind of shake your trunk and see if the root ball moves. That's what we're looking for. Because we want the tree to kind of move a little bit because that creates a strong trunk for us. Um, but we don't want the root ball to move. If the root ball is moving, every time it moves, it pulls those roots out and you're starting all over from scratch. So we want to secure the root ball. And then that's what we're doing when we stake a tree. Nope, there are two, uh, his question was, is, is dormant oil the same as neem? It's a different type of oil. Um, neem is a, it actually will, it, it suffocates as well. So you could probably use it. Um, if you have it, go ahead. Um, I know the mineral oil doesn't break down quite as fast, um, but um, I think that's basically, because in, in my reading about the coddling moths, it did mention neem too. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, her question is about peaches and some of her fruit fell off. Um, like I said, it depends on when they fell off. Um, sometimes um, if it's early in the season, a tree will thin out because it's not healthy enough. Um, it, it, or it, there's just too much for it to hold on to. Um, sometimes the wind can do that as well, or if they're ripe, it, they will drop too. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. Um, so on, on fruit trees, um, they're very susceptible to sunburn. And basically sunburn happens, strangely enough, in the wintertime. Um, so when our trees are, are naked, basically, um, they don't have any canopy to protect the hot sun. And we have days like yesterday with 70 degrees. Um, and, and they can get sunburned. And that's what causes the, the, the cracking. Um, also, if we get a lot of rain um, on one, it's kind of like the tomatoes do in the summertime when we get a, a big rainstorm, they tend to plump up and then they, they crack once they stop getting all that rain. Um, our trees can do that too. Um, so usually that actually happens in the March, April timeframe because the sap is moving and you have that moisture in them. Right now, there's nothing going on, too much going on right now inside your tree. Um, did that answer? Somebody had a question. So the, 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 what you did prevented it, but you wanna do it early. So as soon as you get fruit trees, the first winter, you wanna either use tree wrap, um, which is just a soft cloth, um, that wraps it around, you know, wraps around the trunk of the tree from here to there. Um, and that just protects that tree. Um, you put it on from November to, to East, basically April. Um, once the leaves get on there, they're more protected from the, the sunburn. The paint kind of does the same thing um, because it reflects, as long as it's the white paint, it reflects the, the sun. Well, the, the brown paint is actually for um, the, the, the stumps, I think. I've never seen brown paint. But, I mean, as far as the trunk paint. Huh. Huh. I don't know. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, her question was, is how do pomegranates and figs do in pots? They do really well. Um, actually, the pot, if you, especially if you can kind of keep it closer to your house, that'll help um, with that frost uh, that I, I told you about earlier. Um, and, and pomegranates, the, the small, uh, the angel red would do great because it, it's that small and it, it will work really well in a pot. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> so deer and javelina, typically javelina leave your trees alone unless you have grub problems. Um, the, the javelinas are looking for the grubs and they are out right now, unfortunately. I was digging in my yard the other day and there were grubs in it. So they are coming up to the surface. Um, but deer, um, basically during your summer months, your deer will eat anything that's available. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that you have a cage location for them. Um, whether you wrap, you know, do a four foot wrap around it or you have an orchard where you're kind of fenced in, um, either way to protect your trees because they will, even if it's four foot, they will jump over that because they did it on mine. I had to take it up to seven foot to keep my deer out of it. If you are planting your fruit tree in a pot, you want to use potting soil. You would not use regular soil in there. Um, and you would fertilize probably a little bit more often because you're going to be leaching that pot more often, watering it, and it, it, you'll watch out. No, uh, persimmons are self-fruitful. Correct. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I did mean to touch base on this earlier, but we do not do citrus up here except for in the summertime. It's a house plant. Um, so um, keep them small and uh, don't take them out until after May 
unless you're watching your your it and they're available to move in and out because we can get a frost as late as the 31st of may um, but usually the last frost date is officially like mother's day um, but what i would say is if if just wrap it up um, if you know you put it out sooner okay Perfect. Go, Mackenzie. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Blueberries. Uh, blueberries do very well. Blueberries do need a, sh a shady spot. Uh, they don't like our hot afternoons. <laughs>